All right, well, this morning I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 13, and uh, our section is kind of divided uh, today. It's uh, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and then we're going to look at verses 34 through uh, 43. And uh, kind of like last week, instead of reading the text all at once up front, we're going to read it as we, um, as we go along throughout the, um, the message. They called it Tumblegeddon. It happened on New Year's of this year when a um, 30-foot wall of tumbleweed blew across a highway in Washington and totally engulfed several cars and even a semi-truck, leaving those vehicles totally paralyzed. Just a big mound of tumbleweeds. And um, it took officials over 10 hours in two snowmobiles in order to clear all the tumbleweeds away. Now in this part of the world we don't have to deal with tumbleweeds but we all have to deal with weeds. If you have a garden or even in your uh, grass you know that you have weeds. You know this time of the year when it uh, can't make up its mind what it wants to do weather wise you have those uh, warm spring days and then of course you have the rain and so you begin to have weeds pop up in your in your yard and your grass really isn't growing but you got all those weeds around so you got to get out and cut your grass even when the grass really isn't growing you got to do something with those uh, uh, weeds weeds are quite a um, quite a, a problem and in our text today we deal with the subject of weeds as uh, Jesus gives us another parable today we're going to talk about the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the wheat and uh, the, the weeds. Now, last week, uh, we learned that Jesus, at this point in the Gospel of uh, Matthew, he now begins to teach in parables. Before that, he was very literal in his, um, in his teaching. For instance, Sermon on the Mount, he didn't teach in parables uh, there. It was very, very, very liberal, or literal, excuse me, um, but beginning in Matthew 13, he again starts with these parables. And there was a purpose behind the parables. First of all, a parable is some kind of earthly story that would illustrate a spiritual truth. And Jesus taught in parables really for two different reasons. Number one, he taught in parables to reveal more truth to those who were open to truth. But then on the other side of the coin, Jesus taught in parables in order to hide truth from those whose hearts were hardened to truth. And last week, we looked at the parable of the sower. And if you recall, the parable of the sower dealt with four different types of soil. Again, just like this week's parable, it was an agricultural uh, story. And as the story goes, a farmer goes out, he throws out the seed. The seed falls on four different types of soil. And only one soil proved that it was a healthy soil receptive to the seed because it was the only soil that produced uh, true fruit, a true harvest. And of course, the soils represented the what? The heart. So as as the word of God, the seed, the gospel, is thrown out, you have four different kinds of receptions to the word of God. And only one kind of heart is, is open to the, the seed of the gospel, and it gives evidence that it has received the seed of the gospel through the fruit that it uh, produces. Now today, we come to the parable of the wheat and the tares. This, this parable is only recorded in Matthew. And this deals with um, what is happening between his first coming and his uh, second coming. So I've divided the text up into two divisions today. And as I've always said as a preacher, that's hard for a preacher to only have two points. Seems like you've got to have at least three points. But it doesn't matter how many points you have in your outline, you just have to have a point, right? 
And I think that our text today gives us a point. And so in order to learn the point, we've divided our text up into two divisions. So number one in verses 24 and 30, we see Jesus paints a picture. Jesus paints a picture. So I want to read the verses, verses 24 through 30. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 13. It says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, least in the gathering the weeds, you root up the weed along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So here we have Jesus painting a picture. And what he's going to do is he's going to paint a picture of the kingdom of heaven. And really the next several parables that we deal with in Matthew chapter 13 are all dealing with the kingdom of heaven. He's teaching his disciples what the kingdom of heaven is like because even his disciples had a misconception their understanding was skewed in regards to the kingdom of heaven. And so he uses this parable in order to paint um, a picture. He says, a farmer goes out into the field. Again, uh, Jesus was a master teacher, and he always used illustrations that his audience could relate to. And certainly, the audience of Jesus today could uh, relate to this. This was something they would be very uh, familiar with. So he says, there's a farmer, he goes out, and he sows good seed into his, his field. The good seed is wheat in the um, story. Of course, the farmer would not have actually been the one to throw the seed out. He had workers. And so the, the, the story says that as his workers were sleeping, the farmer has an enemy who during the darkness of the night sneaks into his field where the wheat is already planted and he throws out poisonous or bad seeds among the good seeds. And these, in Jesus' day, sometimes farmers would have enemies, and those enemies, in order to seek revenge or cause problems for a farmer, they would sneak in at night and they would throw in uh, bad seed amongst um, the good seed. And in this case, we're dealing with wheat, and there is a, a type of weed that is even around today. It's called darnel. And darnel is a mimic weed. It looks very, very much like wheat. In fact, until the, the wheat actually begins to produce grain, it is very, very hard to distinguish between the two. They, they look very, very um, uh, much alike. So until the harvest time, it's hard to tell the two apart. Again, darnel is, is, is very poisonous. It's around today. If you, if you eat a lot of uh, darnel, it will uh, make you very sick or even um, kill you. So his workers notice that there is um, the, um, weeds in the harvest. So apparently at this point, the wheat had already started to produce some grain, and so now the wheat is beginning to stand out from the darnel. And they come to their master, and they're like, hey, didn't you give us a good seed? Obviously, you didn't give us bad seed, but we've noticed there are some weeds. There's a lot of weeds amongst the wheat. And, and they're ambitious, and they say, should we go ahead and start to gather the, wheat, or the weeds out from the wheat? And the owner or the, 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 the farmer there says no says don't do that because if you do that you're going to damage the good crop the, the weeds their roots oftentimes would inter, would would intertwine with the roots of the wheat and so they see he says 
just let them grow side by side because if you if you go in there right now and you try to take the weed out it's going to it's going to hurt um, the wheat so just let them kind of intermingle and when the time comes when harvest time comes I will have reapers they were specialized and they had a special eye for distinguishing the weeds from the wheat and they will gather the weeds up they will bind it up and throw it into the oven and then they will gather up the wheat and put it into the barn so that is the picture that Jesus paints and what is this picture that Jesus is painting again remember I told you this has to deal with the kingdom of heaven he says this is what the kingdom of heaven looks like God's kingdom exists in this world and in this world right now citizens of the kingdom dwell side by side next to those who are not part of the kingdom of heaven so that is the picture that Jesus paints with the illustration now we move to the second point and we see Jesus makes a prediction Jesus makes a prediction in verses 34 through 43 and so Jesus has told the story now he's going to explain the meaning of the parable to his disciples and as he gives the explanation he's going to make a prediction so let's read the verses 34 through 43 all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables indeed he said nothing to them without a parable this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet I will open my mouth in parables I will utter what has been uh, hidden since the foundation of the world then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field he answered the one who sows the good seed is the son of man the field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom the weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire so will it be at the end of the age the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears let him hear so in other words Jesus is telling us right now listen up if Jesus says listen up you want to listen up because he's gonna make a very very important statement here as he gives the explanation now you'll notice in these verses before Jesus ex explains the parable we see that Jesus is telling his disciples and the crowd that he is fulfilling prophecy you notice that in those uh, in those verses 34 through 35 he's he's saying by me teaching in parables I am fulfilling what was spoken by the prophet some translations say by the prophet Isaiah and then he quotes a passage of scripture that is actually found in Psalm 78 so Jesus here is just making the point that he's not just randomly teaching in parables but he's doing it in order to fulfill prophecy and then you'll notice he doesn't give an explanation to everybody he first goes into the house we don't know whose house this is it could possibly be Peter's house we, we don't we just don't know for sure um, but he but he doesn't give the explanation to everybody because remember what I told you Jesus taught in parables for two reasons the first reason was to give truth to those who wanted truth and he taught in parables in order to hide truth from those whose hearts were hardened to the truth there were many in the crowd who had no real interest in learning the truth so Jesus is not going to explain the parable to them Stay so goes into the house and notice it says his disciples come in and they're like Jesus explain to us this parable you see the disciples had a hunger for truth they wanted to know the truth and so they come to Jesus and they say Jesus what do you mean by the parable which teaches us a very important lesson 
If you want to understand the Word of God, if you ask God to teach you His Word, He will teach you. So often uh, we say, I, I don't read the Bible because I don't understand the Bible. Well, the question is, do you spend time asking the Lord to help you understand the Bible? And if you're sincere in that, God will help you to understand the truth of His Word. So here we see that Jesus makes a prediction. Not only did Jesus fulfill prophecy, but Jesus gives prophecy. And here's a prophecy that Jesus gives as he gives the, the explanation. Now just to, as we, as we just looked at the story, let's talk about the different elements of the story. And Jesus tells us, and by the way, aren't you glad that you have a copy of God's Word sitting right here in your lap? The crowd didn't have that. But well, we can sit here and we can say, what did Jesus mean? Well, let me read what he meant by the parable. He tells us in detail exactly what the parable uh, means. So, first of all, he says the sower. Who is the sower? He makes that very clearly. Who is the sower? The, the sower. The Son of God. He, he, he says that in verse 37. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. Okay? Very simple. All right? Then... The field. The field in the parable is the world. Some people limit this just to the church. And they say that there are tares within the church. And there are. But the parable is not limiting itself just to the church. It is saying that this, the kingdom of heaven dwells in the world. Okay, So the field represents the world, not just the the church. One commentator said this, this is a picture of the church in the world, not of the world in the church. So Jesus, uh, from, we know from Matthew, he puts his people into the world, Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 through 14, he puts his people into the world in order that we be the salt and light to the world doesn't want to just limit it to the church. Therefore, he spreads his people throughout the world. He plants us in the world, again, not just in the church, in order that we can help reach the world for his glory. So the sower is the son of God. The field is the world. Now the good seed. What is the, the good seed? Now, in the parable of the sower... The seed represented the what? The gospel. Here, the good seed is not the gospel. Don't get confused by that. But the good seed is, is representing Christians. The wheat. The wheat are the Christians. They are sons of God. Alright? Now, the weeds. What do the weeds represent? Well, if the good seed represents the sons of God, Christians, the weeds represent, as Jesus says here, the sons of the devil. These are all unbelievers. Now notice Jesus doesn't limit this just to devil worshipers. You see, you don't have to be a devil worshiper be considered a weed. You just have to be an unbeliever, an unsaved person. And by the way, in the world, there are only two kinds of people. There are sons of God, and there are the sons of the devil. Only two types. There are no middle road. Okay. So today, sitting before me, is a congregation of of two types of people. We have some who are sons of God and there are others here today who are sons of the devil. And We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Now, who is the enemy who sowed the bad seed in the story? Who does that represent? The devil. The devil. And of course, the devil is out sowing bad weeds in this world in order to try, and I emphasize that, try to disrupt God's harvest. Okay. 
Now, what about the harvest? In the parable, what does the harvest represent? It represents God's judgment at the end of the age. When everything is completed, at the end of the age, His angels, which are the reapers, will be sent out and they will gather up all unbelievers. Notice Jesus says here that they will go out and they will gather up um, everything that causes sin and lawbreakers. You see that in verse 41. At the time of the harvest, they will be sent out and they will gather up all unbelievers, lawbreakers, those who cause uh, people to sin, and they will be taken away in judgment. Again, both those who, who sin and those who lead others into sin. But Jesus makes it very clear here. Look at the text. Jesus is preaching a fire and brimstone sermon here. He says, the lost at the end of the age will be gathered up into judgment and they'll be taken away into everlasting torment and misery. Now we live in a day that says preaching on hell is not very politically correct. There's a problem with that though. We have to talk about hell because Jesus talked about hell. And notice he gives a very, very vivid description of hell. He says, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then he talks about the fiery furnace. So it's going to be a place of lesson everlasting torment. There is a lie that says, you know, people who die without Jesus, they go to a place of torment for a little while and then they're just annihilated out of existence. That is not what the Bible teaches. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the smoke of their torment rises day and night. It's talking about an eternal type of, of, of destruction and, and, and torment. It is eternal torment and misery. So on the harvest day, all unbelievers will be harvested up and they will be taken into everlasting torment and misery. But we, but we end on the good note. He says, but the wheat... The, the children of God will be saved and they will be taken to heaven where we will forever experience eternal joy and bliss in His presence. And listen, and the radiance of Christ will fully shine through us. Um, now, you, you study history. Throughout history, there's been all kinds of people to make predictions. And a lot of people have messed up on their predictions. Jesus here makes a prediction that you can bank on. Jesus says this is going to happen. So that's why he closes by saying, he who has ears, let him hear. Listen to what I'm saying, he, he is saying. You, you do not want to miss um, this. All right, so we see Jesus paints a picture, and then Jesus makes a prediction as he explains the meaning of the parable. So, I, I believe there's four words for us in the way of, of application. Four words that as we look at this text that we need to um, apply to our lives. Actually, three. Three words. I had four, but then I took the, I took the fourth one out. So, three, three words of uh, application. I did that as a gift for you, by the way. No, I just combined two of them. So I didn't shorten it, okay? All right, so, so I, I think this text should, should, first of all, drive us to what I call consideration. Consideration. In other words, give careful thought to the truths that, be, can, that can be taken away from this story. Okay, so, so we need to give careful thought. That's what it means for consideration. Give careful, deep, concentrated thought to what we can take out of this story. And, and I believe that there are several truths that we can take out of the story. The world is not an easy place to live in as, unbelie or as believers. We can deduct that from the text. That why is it that this world for believers is a hard place to live in? 
It's because we live in a world where we live next to unbelievers. That is why it's hard. And of course, we have an enemy. We have the, our, our own sinfulness that makes this world difficult to live in. But this world is a, is a difficult place to live because we live in a world full of lost people. And lost people do not think like we think. They have a totally different mindset. They have a totally different uh, uh, system of values that, that cause this world to be difficult for us as believers. If you're saved, you know what I'm talking about to a certain extent. If you work in the secular world, you know that it is very hard at times to work in the secular world because you are working with people who have not had their eyes open and they do not see the things that are very obvious to you. So therefore, they, they view life completely different from you and they don't hold the same values as you do. So the world is not an easy place to live in as unbelievers. Something else that we need to consider not everyone in the church who looks like Christians are Christians. We can easily deduct that, take that truth out of this text today. Now remember, we're not limiting this just to the church, but to the world, but it does apply to the church as well. And so I can confidently say today, because of Jesus' words, that in any church, in any evangelical church in America today, including this church, there are some of you who look very, very, very much like the wheat. But in actuality, you are not actual wheat, but you are a weed. I'm not the one who's saying this. Jesus is uh, saying this. And it is not our job as believers to distinguish who are wheat and who are weeds, but we do know that one day there will be a separation. And we're not going to be the ones doing it. He will be the one who is doing it. So that causes us to ask this very, very important question. How about myself? Am I... Wheat, or am I a tear, or am I uh, uh, a weed? And you say, well, how do I know? We'll go back to the parable of the sower. How do you know that you have a heart in you that has truly received the gospel, that the gospel seed has sprung into life, and you are saved, and you are on your way to glory? How do you know that you are not a weed this morning? Examine the fruit of your life. That's what the text teaches us. How do you know that you're a Christian? Because you believe the facts? The facts of the gospel? Because you... You believe in the Bible, you believe that Jesus came as the Son of Man and He died on a cross and He rose again. Is that how you know? No, the Bible says you know by the fruit that comes out of your life. And so, so if there is one thing that we give consideration to, we must answer the question, am I a wheat or am I a tear this morning? Who am I? Remember, Jesus makes it very clear. This is scary. This is very, very frightening because those weeds, those mimic weeds, look so closely to the actual wheat. They were very, very hard to distinguish. In fact, to the average person, you couldn't distinguish between the two until the harvest time when the wheat would begin to produce the, the actual grain. And so in churches all over America, there are those in the church that look so much like the real thing, but in actuality, they're really not saved and on their way to heaven. And so what is it that we should fear the most? Maybe this morning, boy, you've been watching the news a lot, and all you've heard about is the coronavirus. Listen, our greatest fear does not need to be the coronavirus. 
Today, our greatest fear needs to be dying and going to hell. Most of us, and I, I'm not a prophet, I'm not a fortune teller, certainly. Most of in this in this building are not going to die of coronavirus. But unless Jesus, if Jesus tarries, 100% of us are going to die. It's amazing how we're panicking because there's, there's, there's some people that are dying of coronavirus. Newsflash! There are thousands and thousands of people who are dying every single day. And it has nothing to do with coronavirus. We're all going to die because we're all sinners. And what we need to fear the most is dying without the Savior. Because this is going to be a terrible, terrible, terrible place. And newsflash, hell is not going to be a place that you go to and just hang out with your buddies and continue to, to, to party throughout eternity. It's going to be a terrible place. There are no words that are adequate enough to fully describe the absolute terror of hell. And so we must, we must answer this question in our hearts. Am I wheat or am I a weed? And again, you examine the fruit of your life. I'm not talking about perfection, none of us are perfect. But the consistent pattern of your life, is there any kind of fruit in your life that indicates the Spirit of God is living in your life? Something else that we, can, that we need to consider from this text, and that is this. There is no such thing as a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. You say, Pastor, where do you get that out of the text? Well, because Jesus says that there are going to be weeds intermingled amongst believers. And again, that includes the church. Hey, as Christians, we have a unique way of messing up things ourselves, right? I mean, let's just be honest. But a lot of times, churches have all kinds of problems because there's unbelievers in the church. And so often people say, you know, I don't go to church because there's just a bunch of hypocrites in the church. They're right. You realize the fact that there are hypocrites in the church, you know what that does? It validates the Word of God. It validates what Jesus is saying here. And what better place for hypocrites to be than in the church, right? How are you ever going to stop being a hypocrite unless you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? All right? So we know that there are no perfect churches. So first of all, consideration. Number two, celebration. This text should cause us to celebrate as Christians... Because we are promised in this text a glorious future that awaits us. We are promised that one day, at the end of the age, when everything is done and settled, God's going God's to gather up all his children, and we're going to forever be with the Lord. And that's what's going to make heaven heaven, right? Because we're going to get to go and we're going to get to be with Jesus and as believers, that is our hope. That is our anchor, knowing that we have heaven waiting for us. And I just wonder today, is that what you look to to give you your greatest joy and hope? Knowing that one day, one day we will be taken out of this world and we will be taken into his presence. I know I've said this many, many times before, but there were some things that Jesus said many, many times, so I'm going to say some things many, many times as well. Um, but for believers, this world down here is the worst it will ever get. Amen? This is the worst it will ever get for us as believers. But for unbelievers today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this world is the best it will ever get for you. Wow! Just imagine this world being the best it will ever get. There is no hope in that. No hope. But for those of us who know Christ, man, we have reason to celebrate because we're promised glory. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. What's the worst that can happen if you get coronavirus? Well, more than likely, nothing. You're going to be just fine. But you know what? What's the worst thing? Let's say you die of coronavirus and you know Jesus Christ. You die and you go to glory. What's so wrong with that? 
Is there anything wrong with that? Man, you should be saying absolutely nothing because heaven is going to be an awesome, awesome place. There is nothing that this world has to offer that can pair be being with Jesus for eternity. So we have a reason to celebrate. And then number three. So, so the text causes us consideration, causes celebration. And then number three and finally, concentration. Concentration. I think that this parable should cause us as Christians to concentrate our efforts not on condemning the world, but focusing our efforts on reaching the world. Reaching the world, not condemning the world. You know, it's just like the the servants in the parable. They're like, Lord, you see. There's all these weeds around here. Don't you want us to hurry up and go out and just separate the weeds from the, the wheat? Don't you want us to gather it up? The owner says, no, because if you do that, you're going to cause more damage. And sometimes as Christians, we're just like that. We want to we separate. We want to do all this separating. And it causes more damage. So, so instead of condemning, as Christians, we need to use our time. We need to focus our energy. Not on trying to separate the wheat from the weeds, but instead... Just simply reaching those who are lost with the good news of Jesus Christ. It's God's job to do the judging. And he will do it in his timing and in his way. It is our job to get busy going out and reaching the world. Because one day, the judge is coming. And he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. And the tares will be taken into everlasting torment. I wonder, does that motivate your heart? The thought of a person dying and going to hell, what does that do in your heart? I have presented you with the challenge many, many times. Who's your one? I wonder if this morning, do you even have a one? Have you even given it a consideration to begin praying specifically for one individual because you have a concern for that person and you do not want to see that person die and go to hell? We're talking about inviting people to Easter service. Do you you even take the time to even listen to what I'm saying? Is that important to you? Does this parable do anything in, in your heart whatsoever to motivate you to get out and rescue people from the flames of hell. So, we, we have here consideration, celebration, and concentration. Let us concentrate our efforts as believers to get out into the world and to reach those who are lost. Because you know what the, the amazing thing is? Is maybe, maybe even today, you are here and you would say, you know what, I, I, I just have to, I have to be honest, and I'm, I'm really concerned that, that, that when Jesus looks at me, he doesn't see me as wheat, but he sees me as a weed. You know what the wonderful news is? God is still changing weeds and making them into wheat. That's the wonderful, beautiful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, is it, is it changes let us pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this parable, Lord. You give us a picture of what the kingdom of heaven is like, that as your children, we live every day in a world that is filled with, with weeds, people who, who do not know you. Lord, help us as your people not to condemn them, not to judge them, Lord. We, live, we leave that ultimately up to you. One day you will judge, and there will be a separation, and there will be a penalty there will be a judgment for those who are outside of Christ. But Lord, we, we, we pray that we would have a heart for the lost. Because so many lost people, they don't even see it that one day they will face this judgment. But may we have a, a concern and a love enough for them that we, we go out and we try to reach them with our words and trying to befriend them and just minister to them the life of Jesus Christ. And Lord, certainly today we, we want to be honest today. You told us in in this story to listen up because what you said is so, so important. Lord, if we're truly not saved today and we're just blending in with your people, Lord, would you open our eyes to that reality? Would you give us the faith 
to recognize our need for salvation. We don't, we don't need to rededicate. We need to get saved for the very first time. Lord, help us to be completely honest with you and with ourselves today. And so, Lord, we pray that as we have this time of invitation, uh, we pray that um, your spirit will have liberty to move in hearts. Lord, we, we pray that, um, that we would have the ears to hear and that we would leave today knowing that we've done exactly what you want us to do today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Now may we be good stewards of the word that you've given us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.